Okay, so the first talk of this session is by John Forbes, and uh, please, John, take it away. Well, thanks, um, and um, I'm uh, sad I didn't get to see you all in, in person, but uh, thanks to the organizers for, for giving the, me the opportunity to, to speak anyway. Um, I thought I would uh, share with you all a uh, project we've been uh, working on that combines uh, Th these three uh, cool bits of uh, technology uh, that, that we'll see how they, they work together in, in a bit. Um, this work is uh, led by uh, Gautam Nagaraj, who is uh, a grad student at Penn State, uh, finishing this year. Um, he, he joined us at the CCA uh, for uh, the pre-doc program uh, in 2021. Um, and uh, yeah, we worked together on, on this, uh, this project that's described in these two papers. Um, so yeah, the, the idea is, um, as, as I'm sure you all know, uh, one of the main ways that we infer uh, the properties of individual galaxies is through a process called SED fitting, which uh, takes um, all of these ingredients, uh, you know, IMF, isochrones, uh, the spectra of individual stars, uh, combines them all into um, uh, simple stellar populations, uh, which show you um, at a fixed age what the spectrum of a population of stars of that age uh, should be. Combine those um, with a history of metallicities and star formation rates, and you attenuate it by dust, and you uh, add dust emission to the spectrum, and then you, you get a prediction for what the, um, the spectrum of the galaxy should be as a function of physical parameters that you're probably a bit more interested in. Um, and uh, yeah, so one of the, there are many tools to that go through this process, um, and this this is a process that uh, kind of lends itself to uh, Bayesian inference, um, where you know you have a model with a bunch of physical parameters, you have data that you want to compare to, and you want to you know, do inference uh, to get to back out the the physical parameters of each individual galaxy. Um, and so we're we're building on the results of this uh, this tool called Prospector, which which attempts to to do this this whole process. Um, and this this is a very nice example from from a local uh, local galaxy where where uh, sort of this tool was was first kind of um, well where this tool was um, um, validated uh, by comparing to a whole bunch of other information besides just the SED. Um, and, and so this uh, this shows you the spectrum of, of the local galaxy and the observed values with very small error bars are the red points and the fit are the blue is the blue point. And you can see this, this is an excellent fit and you can back out things like the star formation history of this, of this galaxy. Um, and in fact, you get the full uh, posterior distribution of all the parameters that you put in. Um, this is a nice, nice corner plot. Uh, if you look very carefully, you know the the uh, values on the on the axes are are pretty narrow because the data here is so good. But you may also notice that there are a bunch of pairs of parameters that are degenerate with each other, um, and these tend to be related to uh, dust, metallicity, star formation. Um, and this, this is sort of uh, a restatement of a, a very well-known uh, aspect of SED modeling, the, that there's a degeneracy between um, the age of a stellar population and the dust attenuation. Basically, uh, the older and dustier a population is, the redder it looks. Um, and this is just you know, the, the very fancy way of, of expressing that. Um, so what this... What this um, leads us to is the point that dust parameters for any individual galaxy are quite uncertain a priori. Um, individual galaxies, and this, this is because individual galaxies have a wide range of dust, dust properties. And so because this, um, because the dust properties are degenerate with other properties, the, the, the age and the star formation history, um, 
metallicity, uh, this uncertainty in the dust drives uncertainty in um, a lot of other parameters than usually you care about more, those more than you care about the dust. Um, although this, this project is, is an exception to that. Um, so what we're going to do is um, focus our efforts on trying to understand uh, this, this piece of the SED fitting puzzle, which is uh, the amount of dust, the effect of dust um, that uh, absorbs starlight uh, in your galaxies um, as a function of wavelength. It's defined by, it's called a dust attenuation curve, often normalized by the amount of dust uh, attenuation. In, this is expressed in terms of optical depth in the V-band. Um, sometimes there's a bump in this relation, um, and but basi basically the the you know there there are lots of ways you can you can parameterize this, but but um, what we're going to focus on here are uh, the normalization and the slope. And by normalization, I just mean how much V-band dust there is, and um, you, this will also variously appear as as these other related quantities. And the slope is sort of how how preferential, um, how much uh, dust absorbs blue light preferentially to red light um, relative to some uh, fixed uh, uh, fiducial, i.e. The, the Calzetti law, which, which has its own dependence, which is uh, not flat, but um, so, so yeah, usually people, you know, you, you start from Calzetti and then you perturb that. Um, and so you can have steeper or, or flatter than, than Calzetti. Um, and what we're going to assume in order to try to get a handle on uh, the dust properties is that the dust properties are a function of other galaxy properties plus some scatter. So at a given location in say stellar mass, star formation rate, metallicity, uh, redshift, it, what, um, it, all these things, um, there's a Gaussian distribution of, of dust properties. Uh, so that's our assumption. And so there, there's very little physics in this, in this population model. We're basically just assuming that um, if you look at the distribution at, at one location, in, in those independent variables, um, the distribution won't change a lot if you go to a nearby location. So that's the extent of sort of the physical um, uh, intuition that we're, that we're going to be uh, building here. Um, okay, so, so how do we, um, right, so, so so we, we're, we're going to try to make this assumption that the dust properties are some function of other galaxy properties. Um, and we're, the data we're going to be using are data from the 3D HST survey. So there are, uh, so each, each of these plots that I'm going to be showing based on this data contains something like 30,000 galaxies um, that have, uh, well, and each one has a, a prospector fit. And so, so the, the sort of, um, currency that we're working with in this in this project is um, sort of samples from the posterior distribution that are generated by Prospector, which uses um, uh, nested sampling underneath it, at least in, in this version. Um, and and yeah, um, so so as an example of of um, how you would usually do this without without going sort of the full Bayesian route is you would you would take some uh, some uh, independent variables that you might be interested in. So it's so a stellar mass, and this is the uh, total dust attenuation. Uh, the yeah some version of the total dust attenuation, and in each bin here, uh, we're showing the slope of the dust attenuation curve relative to Calzetti. So this is the this is the offset zero zero would be a Calzetti curve, um, and you just bin it up. Um, and and you look for patterns, um, and so people people have done this uh, for rich zero galaxies. People do this all the time. Um, this is, uh, and you you can see that there there are indeed some patterns. Uh, so and and is smaller at higher uh, stellar masses and uh, lower uh, total dust attenuation. Um, the problem with this though is that the galaxy's location 
is very uncertain. So the, the issue is that these, these properties that you're trying to bin in, like stellar mass and tau two, are themselves inferred from the SED fitting, and so they may have very large error bars. Um, so you don't actually know which which bin each galaxy belongs to. Um, and in fact, the, the quantity that you're taking the, the mean of in each bin n is also inferred by the SED and hence it also has uncertainty. And all of these uncertainties are correlated with each other. And so you can construct examples, which we, we, we did in this paper where, um, where you know you know the, the ground truth and you, you do your inference process. Um, and when you're in the situation where where the uh, the properties of the galaxies are correlated in in the posterior, um, you're in danger of inferring trends in the population that, that don't exist um, if you uh, are not sufficiently careful with how you model them. And that includes just binning them up in, in a histogram. Um, so, um, what we do instead is instead of averaging in the bins, we're going to do something that scales a bit better to higher dimensions. So we, we don't want to be creating a 5D histogram. Instead, what we do is we create a, a five-dimensional interpolation function um, in these uh, variables that we think are likely to have uh, some influence on the dust properties. Um, and um, what our goal is, is to find the a Bayesian estimate of the parameters that control this interpolation function. Um, and the parameters that we're, that we're you know, doing this inference on are basically like, this is, this is like the 1D example. Um, we're basically, we're assuming that um, as, you, as you change your independent variables, you, uh, you're going to smoothly change your uh, dust properties. Um, and um, we just linearly interpolate in between them. It lo looks kind of ratty for a 1D case, but in, in the 5D case, you want to try to keep it simple. And so, so we do, in fact, use, use linear interpolation in, in those five dimensions. And the parameters that we're inferring are the location are the locations of these, um, these points. So we, we sort of fix where they are in the independent variable first, and then the parameters we infer are the, the values of the dust properties at those control points. Um, so very little physics. It's it's just we're we're sort of trying to get a, a description of the population that um, that properly takes into account all of the error bars and covariances in the posterior distributions of each galaxy. Um, and so we we build this this model in uh, Pi MC three, which allows us to um, actually infer. Um, the values for these interpolation points, um, the, the values of the dust parameters at these interpolating points, which are shown here as, as these red dots. So in this case, we've we sort of we have five per dimension, uh, but of course that means that in total we have you know, three thousand ish parameters, and formally we have a lot more because uh, you know in the hierarchical model where um, each galaxy has its own value of of you know, the stellar mass, the, the dust content, the slope, and, and all these things. Um, but we're marginalizing over all of those to make the inference easier. Um, but because we, uh, we've we built this model in, in Pi MC3, we can take advantage of, of uh, efficient sampling techniques like Ham Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, and what you can see is that sort of a broad pattern from the naive histogram still persists. You still have Higher and up here, and lower and down here in the in the full model, um, but it's it's qualitatively you know fairly there there well there are a lot of a lot of differences in in how this works, and this is just you know sort of one one slice, and you can imagine that um, that uh, you know the contrast between these two things depends on sort of which slice you're looking at. Um, um, but yeah, so, so we, we, we uh, fit this model, um, and then we can, we can look at some of the key trends that we get out. Um, so, so this is, this is uh, kind of the main one. Um, so on the x-axis here is the total amount of dust attenuation in a given galaxy, and on the y-axis is the slope, which, which has a one-to-one -one mapping to n that, we're, that we are actually using in the model. Um, 
and where again Calzetti is a, is the reference here, where n equals zero. Um, this uh, this uh, I guess I, I would say that this Salim z equals zero result uh, from Salim et al. 2018 is is kind of the um, the poster child for this relationship, where uh, as you as you get to lower and lower uh, dust attenuations, your slope gets steeper and steeper. Um, we see in, in Nagaraj et al. Uh, a similar trend, but not, not nearly as pronounced. And part of this is because we're looking at, because we're using the 3D HST sample, our sample sort of ranges in redshift from 0.5 to 3. So we're, we're at a bit higher redshift. Um, this is also kind of the result of using Prospector, which um, tends to infer for individual galaxies, uh, older, redder, uh, populations, and so you don't need as much, you infer less dust than than other methods might. Um, and then on top of that, we, we have this uh, hierarchical framework, so we're, we're at least, you know, confident that we've sort of combined the data in, in a reliable way. Um, the, an another sort of cool thing we can, we can look at is, you know, uh, projections in any any of the 2D spaces that we that we used uh, when constructing the model. So this is two out of the five dimensions. Um, so I'm showing you here stellar mass versus uh, B over A, the, the axis ratio of the of the galaxies. So if the galaxy is a disk, then edge on disks will live down here and face on disk will live up here. And the color is showing you how much dust is inferred to be on average in a galaxy with those properties. Um, and what you can see is that the the uh, the amount of dust inferred uh, tends to be higher for for edge on disks, but only above a uh, stellar mass of ten to the ten. Um, below that, it seems to care. That's kind of the trend. It uh, is much weaker and and even reverses sign. Um, so we can we can delve into this a little a little bit more. Um, by by looking at a few of the other dimensions that we have that our that our model is is fit on, um, so this is kind of showing this will kind of show you a, a similar effect. Um, so now what we're looking at is now now we've added um, star formation rate to the mix. Um, so and we're what this plot is showing you as a function of stellar mass and star formation rate. So you know the mean sequence is somewhere up here. Um, the color is showing you how correlated the um, the dust attenuation is to the axis ratio. So the highest correlation is for uh, is over here for sort of high stellar masses and high star formation rates. Um, and there you see this effect again that um, as you go to more edge on disk, you get more attenuation. Um, but over here uh, in this region, there's there's no correlation between uh, tau effective and B over A, uh, and this is in in a region probably populated by uh, by dwarf galaxies. Um, things that are um, these are probably quenched, so they're you know, probably satellites uh, environmentally you know, quenched by their by their neighbors, and and for those you know it it, it appears not to matter uh, really what their uh, what their orientation is. They they have roughly the same amount of dust. Um, and so, so th these are just sort of a few, a few cool examples. And I wanted to say, you know, I am absolutely certain we have not looked at, at every interesting thing that's in our own model, um, but the results are all um, uh, public. Uh, you can just uh, install it in this nice, nice little Python package, um, and and so you can you can uh, hunt for for interesting relations as well. Um, but one of the one of the key um, Things that I think that we thought would be very valuable to do with with a package like this is to apply it to post processing um, of simulations. Um, so so that's what we did in uh, this, uh, the second paper. Um, so what I'm what I'm showing you here is the uh, UVJ diagram. So this is um, a diagnostic tool that people use to understand um, whether a galaxy is star forming. So that's uh, that's in this region, quiescent up here, or you can also have um, 
a dusty star forming galaxy and those would live over here and people sort of debate like where exactly to draw this line um but the yeah but the point is you know this the, these colors turn out to be useful in in trying to determine whether a galaxy is red because it's quiescent or because it's dusty um and so what, what i'm showing you here is um where the population of galaxies lives in TNG 100 before you apply any dust. So that's that's the red uh, the red histograms. Um, blue shows you our estimate of what 3D HST would look like if you remove the dust. So that's why there's a little star here. This is kind of data, but it's you know heavily processed. We're we're sort of using our own model to take out the dust. Um, and you can see that that you know there there are subtle differences, but it's it's actually you know pretty good. Um, the TNG galaxies mostly live where the real galaxies do if you don't have dust, um, and and we we sort of we think we understand where these differences come from. It's sort of slight differences in the inferred ages um, and the distribution of ages and, and metallicities in in TNG versus what we infer in the data in this data set. Um, but you know, it, it looks pretty good. Um, now, when you add dust, um, so, so this this is the same same diagram UVJ um, with dust, and there are two different versions of the dust. So the data, the data itself is this is blue. So now you can see that there are galaxies in this region that are um, uh, dusty and star forming. Um, the and then the red and the orange are both from the simulation with dust added in two different ways. So in the red, we're using our empirical dust model. And you can see that, you know, again, we produce some dusty star forming galaxies. It doesn't have exactly the same shape as the data, um, which is to be expected. Um, the previous state of the art was this paper by uh, Denari et al, where they, what they attempted to do was, you know, sort of integrate along lines of sight in the simulation itself. Um, and you can see that that has that scheme has a very difficult time producing any dusty star forming galaxies. Um, and so um, we encourage people who are running cosmological simulations, if you want to um, create um, mock photometry, it's it's probably a good idea to use uh, an empirical dust model like this instead of trying to um, integrate through the simulation itself. Um, so and then the the work in progress. What we're working on now is no, no. <coughs> sorry, yes. one minute. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm I'm almost done here. So so the the thing we're working on now is um, uh, you know, going back to these uh, degeneracies that sort of prompted us to look at, at dust in the first place. Um, we can now use our uh, our uh, model of the dust to uh, narrow down a priori what we expect um, the galaxy's dust properties to be. Um, each time we do this fit. And so we hope this will um, sort of improve inferences from, from SED fitting uh, down the line. Um, so here, here are the takeaways. Uh, dust attenuation matters. Um, it it uh, matters as a function of these quantities, but not in any simple way that you could just put in a power law. Uh, the empirical dust model is a very nice tool for post-processing galaxies and you can um, and you can access them on Python immediately. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John, for the for the talk. Uh, questions for John? Uh, hi, John. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I had two questions. I hope it's okay. Uh, the first question I had uh, is about the diagram you showed with the slope as a function of A sub V, where you compare sure. to Calcetti and the rest. Yes. yes. Um, so have you tried to divide your sample into redshift bins and to see how your relation changes for lower redshift and higher redshift galaxies? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I think we... Um, we may have looked at that in, in passing, but it didn't didn't make it into the paper, and I don't remember off the top of my head what the what the answer is. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll uh, take a look then. Uh, and the second question I had, um, I perhaps I missed it, but 
in your modeling, when you're modeling the dust attenuation uh, and performing SCD fitting, you're taking into account when predicting the spectral energy distribution, in particular the far infrared emission, you're taking into account the, this extinction curve that you're extracting, right? Yeah, that, that's that's correct. Where 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 the yeah where the data is available, um, you know, it, it gets into a whole can of worms with you know you have to you have to match sort of uh, messy Spitzer data to you know individual 3D HST galaxies, and, but um, you know we all of that is to the to the degree possible folded into the initial prospector fits. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. More questions? Uh, hi, John. This was fantastic. Uh, really great work. I just wanted to ask you if you have opinions about uh, sort of using this empirical dust model as a prior in SED fitting that you sort of hinted at towards the end of your talk, and whether there might be like inbuilt effects of things like uh, selection biases or uh, you know, like observational systematics that might creep in. And yeah. What do you think of that? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for the question. And I, I hope this was a nice uh, intro for your talk, which is <laughs> coming up next. Uh, um, um, yeah, uh, I think, you know, we, we focused on the sample of the subsample of 3DHST that we think is is mass complete. So, you know, this isn't every 3DHST galaxy. This is every 3DHST galaxy with a stellar mass above a threshold which evolves with redshift. Um, so, so yeah, you and and we sort of in the model we we give you a warning if you sort of try to extrapolate it outside the the bounds of you know the the region in the independent variables where we. Uh, where we sort of trust the model, you know, blind extrapolation doesn't work very well. Uh, sort of assuming a constant value outside the re or the region where where we use this fit is is okay. Um, but yeah, it's it certainly you know because it, it's a very data driven model containing very little physics. Um, yeah, you don't want to be extrapolating it. Um, but in in the region where um, where it has where where the data uh, actually comes from, I think. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with it. Um, what we're testing is basically, um, we're, we're doing, you know, recovery tests where you, you don't have as much data as you had for these galaxies. Um, if you include the dust, the dust prior and then you check, um, the inferred properties of the galaxy against auxiliary information that you didn't use in the fit, how, how well do you do? We're, you know, we're doing those tests now, but, um, you know, I, I'm optimistic. I, I think, uh, this is, this is sort of kind of the right way to, uh, combine this data to infer this. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> I had another yep. question. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you'll have time to answer the rest of the questions. Uh, I wanted to ask about the comparison with uh, TNG, which you yep. showed uh, with the three different histograms. Yes. Um, so the Donari et al. paper, is it radiative transfer that they're doing? Um, it's, it's, you know, very approximate. It's, it's not real radiative transfer. I think basically they're, you know, casting lines of sight through through uh, TNG and sort of estimating sort of on average how much um, how much material uh, how, you know how many gas particles does that line of sight intersect? It's it's, it's, a, it's a very basic uh, rate of transfer you can think of it. I think so. They infer the column density of hydrogen along the line of sight and then assume some extinction according to I don't know Calcetti or something like this. Yes, it, it's it's something like that. I, I mean, the, yeah, um, it's, yeah, the Denari paper is built on, you know, uh, a paper by Nelson et al. where they, you know, they have, they try the, the original, yeah, I think this is um, Nelson et al. 2018, where they show that, that TNG is able to produce a galaxy color bimodality in the first place. Um, and, you know, they try a few different uh, dust models and, and one of them, which, which does this sort of line of sight uh, projection thing, uh, is what they used in Denari to, to check the UVJ diagram. 
I see. So, so yeah, I think part part of the issue is is probably that uh, that you know TNG itself you know doesn't have doesn't quite have the resolution to get some of the very high column density points that you would expect in in this region, um, and so you know you might have more luck with radio transfer or uh, approximate even approximate radio transfer um, in higher resolution simulations. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. All right, so let's uh, thank uh, John once again. Uh,